Sorry, that was normal, man. That was fucking normal. <laughs> it's <laughs> me. <and> me. <laughs> okay, I'm good and cut. Hey guys, how we doing? I'm pretty good. How are you guys? All right. Uh, this week, welcome to G Jack and so on. We have uh Robert Fowler, writer of a number of books, including what we uh, read today, which is called On the Pleasure Principle in Culture. Illusions Without Owners. Yeah, and then uh, Inner Passivity, The Aesthetics of Delegated Enjoyment. Uh, yeah, came up with this idea of inner passivity, and we uh, have talked about it before, but we wanted to talk about it with him today, and uh, I think it's a pretty interesting conversation. Yeah, uh, is the is the inner passivity episode uh, on our Patreon? Yes. Yes. Yes, Will, it is. And to hear it, uh, sign up for the Patreon. Five bucks a month, access to all of our back catalog of episodes and all of our future episodes in perpetuity, forever and ever and ever. And also part two of the Robert Fowler interview. It's a two-parter. Actually, the conversation, not to downplay the first part, but the second part really took off. This week we're releasing that same episode as a public episode, and if you want access to uh, the aforementioned second part of this episode, uh, we're releasing it today. So, so... Don't wait, don't delay, uh, listen to part two uh, later. We also uh, given in to popular demand. Uh, we're not letting Michael speak anymore in the introductions. Mm. Uh, no, no, no. He's a gag order. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Uh, see you guys uh, another week. And, and roll the, roll, roll Robert. Always <laughs> The California. You know what? You, 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 beep, 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 you know, trip me out. When I realized it's uh, it's a reggae song, <laughs> it, but better than reggae. Hey, hello, hello. Wow. <laughs> uh, why can I not see you? <laughs> hmm, funny. You can see me. Yep. Yeah, we can see uh, you. Strange. Okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> Not the biggest problem. As long as we can hear each other. Yes, yes. Okay, nice to hear you. <laughs> nice to hear you. So rest assured, we are people. Okay. Just yeah. some kind of advanced AI chat yeah. uh, scam. I'm William. Okay. Canada. Uh, Peter. And Michael. We, we're Zizek and so on. We have a podcast about Zizek and Zizek related works. We've actually done an episode, a couple episodes on your work before. Okay. Uh, one on inner passivity, which we'd actually like to talk to you about today, and also one on examples. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm in France right now, William. Um, okay. Peter is in Canada and Toronto. Yes. And Michael is in Australia. Okay. Wow. And, and so uh, me and me and Peter are, are brothers. That's how we know each other. And we 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 met I Michael uh, through the on the internet. I see. Yeah, we started uh, we started out as Michael's uh, inner passive friends, and then <laughs> yeah. became his actual. <laughs> so, uh, actually, kind of following your question posed to us, I think we kind of have a similar question for you. We'd like to ask it, you know, kind of what what your relationship with Gzek's work is, and how you feel like it's informed your work, or where it, you know where you depart from it, or any of these things. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I know. Zizek's works since the late 1980s. Mm. Um, Zizek became, became known in the German-speaking world through the journal that his group and he published uh, called Wo Is War, where I was, famous Freudian quote, that was published in German. So these were the first essays that I got to read from Zizek and Dolna and others. And um, not much later, 
uh, a journal was founded in Vienna, which was called Mesotes. And uh, also this journal published essays by Shishek, Dula, Salnetzl, and others. And this was actually how we got into contact. Um, the editor of Mesotes was a close friend of mine. And at that time, I was still a student of philosophy. And I had founded, together with two of my colleagues, an Althusserian group at the Institute of Philosophy. We were devoted to studying Althusser. I can tell you a little more about the reasons later. And at that moment, um, the uh, journal Mesotes published an essay by Mladen Gola on Althusser. And the director of the journal gave me the manuscript in advance and said, wouldn't you like to reply to this? And we sent a reply to Gola. And at some points in, in Europe, we got into contact with Zizek in Berlin and in Vienna when he gave a lecture. And very soon, um, the Zizek and his friends um, started to be interested in the Althusserian group. And so they invited us for a lecture at the seminar of Mladen Gola. That's actually how we got together, and I think it was in June 1990. And so from that time on, we started a very deep personal friendship with a slight philosophical divide. The same divide, I think, that separates Bacanians from Althusserians and Hegelians from Spinozists. And most of our debates went along these lines. So in philosophical terms, we have a, a slight but profound difference, whereas with regard to political struggles, we stand very often on the same side. So we've shared many positions since that was what I mentioned before. The reason why we founded our group in Vienna was that in the mid eighties, there was a kind of shift of paradigm in Vienna's philosophy scene. Until then, philosophy had been mainly Marxist, but all of a sudden, philosophy became very chic and very bourgeois. And there was a huge kind of bourgeois reception of well, the French so-called post-structuralists. And the funny thing at that time was that Althusser was never fashionable neither before nor after this breaking point. Before, <laughs> he had like Frankfurt School Marxists and all kind of orthodox Marxists, but no Althusserians. And then the narrative of this bourgeois fashionable group that indulged in Derrida and Levinas and, and so on. Also a bit of Lacan, but mo mostly I think Derrida and, and Deleuze and Greek and so on. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they pretended that this new French philosophy did not contain any Marxist sources. And we found that profoundly wrong. We thought Althusser is one important contributor to this new development. And um, this should not be forgotten. And even more importantly, what divided us from them was on the one hand, of course, the political stance, but also the way of speaking. We did not like this covering of this opaque French language by second-class adopters, and we tried to insist on a clear way of speaking with each other in the seminar. So this was the formal dividing line, and that's how we fought against these postmodernists from our Althusserian positions. And that was something that the Lekingian group in Ljubljana liked very much, and that's why we became friends. And so we started sharing arguments, ideas, and having small, funny, friendly struggles about our basic philosophy convictions. <laughs> That's interesting. So there was like a kind of shared disagreement over post-structuralism that, that was yes. kind of the, the like new, like in vogue type of philosophy. Yes, right. Yes. And so <clears throat> that continued over many years. For example, in 2000 and 2001, I was a member of the Slavist research group in Essen in Germany at the Institute for Cultural Theory, and a research group was assembled under the title Antinomies of Postmodern Reason, but that was <laughs> in a way Interesting. The, <laughs> the leading <laughs> title. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you've 
you've been engaging with Zizek and you've known him since the late 80s, early 90s. Just out of curiosity, like, what is it like to have seen through that time the kind of rise of Zizek's notoriety or his influence in, in the philosophical and general, like, cultural world? Or maybe lack of influence. At yeah. Other. <laughs> well, to us, it was perfectly understandable that a philosophy that is, on the one hand, so deep and so clear and from which you can really learn the most interesting things about all kinds of classical philosophy, but also about Lacan, that this is really worth listening to. And at the same time, Gilek's wit and the charm way how he presents this line of thought uh, that would certainly open him up the biggest audiences. We were convinced of this from the first lectures that we heard by Zizek in the late 80s. And I'm very happy that he had this international success and that he really managed to gain so many followers from a scene which is not by necessity leftist. Mm. And then to speak kind of moving the other way then, uh, I believe, Michael, you, I, I don't have the exact wording, but Michael was shared a quote with me from the back of one of your books that Zizek wrote, where he said something to the effect that, that you had created a concept, which was a very rare occurrence in philosophy, something that only happens every so often. And something that was also striking for, to me when I was reading your interpassivity book was at one point used the language of uh, discovering the concept of interpassivity which reminded me of the same language that Freud had used of discovering a new concept. So how do you see your discovery of the concept of interpassivity? It's clearly kind of been the terrain of your work subsequently. So if you can comment on that. Um, as you may know, I work at the University for Art and Industrial Design in Linz, Upper Austria. Um, I started working there in the early 90s. And Linz was one of the key strongholds of electronic media art in not only in Austria, but in whole Europe. There's the P2 Institute in, in Rotterdam, uh, V2, excuse me, V2, and the Ars Electronica and Dienst. These were the pioneers of this art. The Institute in Austria was founded by the artist Peter Weibel, a very important figure in the Austrian after war avant-garde, who unfortunately passed away a few days ago. And so this was very influential also on my students at the art university. And the funny thing at that time was that electronic media art brought about a whole ideology of interactivity. Uh -huh. and, and so the students, even if they made good works, were somehow irritated by this discourse. They were always asking themselves, for example, that made a space installation and then they came and shyly asked, what do you think, Robert? Should I maybe make it more interactive? Or something? So mm -hmm. interactive, interactivity was a kind of necessity or obligation at the time. Like he's tried to relate to that discourse. And coming from Althusser, I was quite aware that not only in science, but also in art, there exist specific fashionable ideologies. So like what scientists explain to themselves what is good about their method is often a quite naive narrative, which is um, inferior to the actual philosophy that they practice in their scientific work. This is the discovery made actually by Althusser's teacher, Gaston Bachelard, and he speaks about the, the philosophy of the scientists. The philosophy of the scientists is often not on the level of the actual practiced philosophy that the scientists use in their science. But what they declare to be their philosophy is a kind of naive, infantile picture of what they actually do. And the same can happen to artists. I just have called this problem philosophy and the spontaneous philosophy of the scientists. And there's an equivalent in the art world. There's also a spontaneous philosophy of the artist, which is actually not accounting for what is good in the art world. Now, of course, if you are Nietzscheans, you could say, well, maybe this is the necessity of illusions that you have to make yourself about your work. And maybe it's healthy if you can indulge in certain illusions about your work. This may be true. But at some point, if you start working according to the principles that you have declared in your philosophy, 
then your next work will be inferior to the previous work because um, obviously if we follow uh, principles that are worse than those that you already had used with success before. And that, that was the danger that I saw and at the same time the role that I saw for myself as a philosopher, as a philosopher engaged at an art university. I had to listen to the philosophers, to the philosophies that the artists proclaim, and I had to compare it to the philosophy that I saw at work in their artworks. And it was obvious to me that the artworks were much more clever than his interactivity discourse that was the, uh, brought about not only by artists, but certainly also by curators and reads that jumped on that train. And so this was pretty powerful. And in order to emancipate my students from this powerful discourse, I started on asking funny questions like, is there an opposite of interactivity? And the students said, well, maybe if there's no interactivity. And I said, listen, um, an opposite is not, if there's not a thing, you know, the opposite of your money is not no money, but debt. That's <laughs> negative to money. Mm -hmm. yes. That's what Immanuel Kant calls a negative measure. No? And so we thought, what could be a negative measure of interactivity? And so we said, how is interactivity uh, explained by its proponents? And the answer was, okay, interactivity consists in here be the artwork um, and some of the creative work um, that accomplishes the artwork is not yet contained in the artwork, but delegated to the observers. So the observers have to contribute some artwork, some artistic input to the artwork in order to make the artwork complete. So there's the artwork, simplify this by like this, but not all the work is already contained, but the work is transferred upon the observers who become then creative and emancipated and not only passive, but active, that receive something positive. <clears throat> and that is the transfer that goes on here. Uh, creativity, activity is transferred upon the server. Now, what would be the opposite transfer? We said, well, that would be the case when something that before was on the side of the service would be transferred upon the art. You know? So if the observer was according to the meter activity merity before were passive, just observing, laughing, whatever, the opposite of interactivity would actually be an artwork that would already contain this so-called passivity of the observers, that would already contain passive observation. So the artwork would basically look at its hand, observe its hand, signal to the observers, you can go home, I have seen myself already. So liberating them from their passivity, as it were. No? So that was the thought experiment that we started and it was quite amusing and funny and, and we were looking around what if such a thing could actually exist and how it would work. And mm. two, two things came to our head at the time. One aid came, of course, from theory and it was a very precious uh, element that uh, I could find in Zizek's theory. Zizek had developed this for a completely different purpose. Zizek was commenting upon the remark by Lacan that the unconscious exists outside, not being the inside depth of whatever consciousness, but the unconscious is outside. And Zizek explained that by commenting upon an example of Lacan. Lacan made the point that in Greek tragedy, the chorus was actually acting out the emotions of the observers. The chorus was like saying how sad all this is, whereas the observers were completely relieved from feeling grief or from feeling to have been up Daniels and Phobos uh, misery and fear, as Aristotle would have explained. But instead, the concept neither in fear were already fed by the chorus. The observers could talk about whatever debt, money, please and Zizek made a second example that was very beautiful. He said, the static happens to him when he comes home in the evening, tired from the day's work. He switches on the television and he's very happy if there is a sitcom going on where uh, 
there are not only funny scenes and jokes, but also the sitcom is already laughing about itself. And Sishek found that extremely relieving. He said, I don't have to pay attention. I don't listen to jokes and anything, but then he liked to switch it on and let it laugh. It laughs on my behalf vicariously. And after like half an hour, I really have the feeling that I have been properly being amused or I have been, he said, in the beautiful old Stalinist language, I've been objectively amused. <laughs> and this example by, by Zizek um, was a perfect example for our purposes. We saw in the first place, it is possible that the artwork can contain some of the so-called passivity. It can contain laughter or mourning, whatever grief and so on, weeping. Um, and so all these allegedly deep, intimate feelings can be delegated, for example, to an artwork. The artwork thus can observe itself, and there are observers, like Shinshet, who enjoy that, who like their passivity being delegated to the artwork. So we were still fighting on the enemy's ground. We were using the language of interactivity discourse, and by their language, we could declare there are artworks that already contain the passivity of the observation. Of course, this is a highly ideological language because we all know just observing is not only passive, it can be a very critical observer that reads the artwork against, against the grain and everything. And activity, on the other hand, is not, not at all a sign of freedom. You can also be a very active slave or whatever <laughs> Spinoza has declared. So, of course, these were all the flaws proper to the interactivity discourse. But if we took this discourse for a moment and seriously, we could show that a negative measure of interactivity actually existed, that artworks could contain the perceived observation and observers existed who enjoyed that. That was the theoretical point that we made up. And at the same time, we could see that that was already happening in the arts at the time on many levels. For example, there was a kind of low-tech art at the time, fashionable in, in European um, art world. I don't know if you remember that. that it was called service art. So um, famous names of this genre were, for example, Ricky Tirabanica or Philippe Parino, French artist. But it was, a, it was made by many artists who are not so known anymore today. And also my students uh, very much indulged in this kind of service art. The usual setting of service art was like this. You would enter a gallery or an off space, and it would look a bit like a post office. You were, had service desks and artists sitting behind them, and they had forms in front of them. And if you wanted somehow to engage with the artists, you would have to go there and fill in a form. And a form would, for example, say, um, you are meeting somebody tomorrow at the coffee shop in the afternoon. Wouldn't you maybe like the artist to go there in your place? And if so, please uh, fill in the form, tell the artist whom you are going to meet, for how long the meeting should be held, uh, in what kind of tone the artist should speak to your interlocutor, should should the artist speak like a friend or like a professional contact or maybe like a lover? What do you want and what should be the outcome and so on? So you had to fill in a series of uh, questions and then the artist would do uh, what you had assigned them to. Um, of course, and that was actually what the artists tended to do at the time, you could explain this as cases of interactivity. The artwork would not exist if you didn't go to the paint to fill in the forms and, and answer all these questions and so on. So you had to contribute actively in a certain way. But the crucial question actually was behind it. Uh, the question, how we relate to our pleasures. You know? Usually we engage people, for example, to clean our windows at home so that we can go out to the coffee shop and meet our friends. But the deep philosophical question that these service artists were raising was the opposite. 
wouldn't you maybe prefer that the artist goes to the coffee shop and meets your friends, <laughs> that you are treated from your pleasures so that you can maybe stay at home and clean your windows or whatever, no? So it, it uh, asked very fundamental questions about our relationship to work and pleasure. And if we sometimes uh, don't even don't find your, our pleasures even more exhausting than our works and so on, and if we wouldn't like to have them delegated. So I think that was a profound philosophical question. And that was, of course, only possible to raise under the condition that we did not interpret these works as interactive, but that we saw in them the key question of interpassivity, which is, wouldn't you like your pleasures to be delegated to some other agent, to an artist, to a machine, to a television comedy or whatever, or for example, wouldn't you like to have your uh, television consumption delegated to a recording device and so on. And from there on, a huge variety of questions opened up uh, and we saw the presence of interpassive structures in big areas of our lives. For example, as intellectuals, you will know that at least for a long time, it was usual that intellectuals went to libraries and copied a huge amount of pages from books and went home very happy uh, and stored these pages somewhere without ever finding them again. But the happiness was achieved instantaneously when they copied uh, the book in, in the library. They took the book and this copying machine uh, threw something like the light of attention on the pages, read the page through, scanned it, more the intellectual would turn the page, put the book again on his face of this um, copying machine and so on. So in a way, we could say that was a literal playing or staging of a reading action. And this reading was performed vicariously by the copying machine. So in many of our everyday experiences, we could encounter these structures. And we often now had to ask ourselves this quite uncanny question, if we wouldn't prefer that somebody else did what we claimed our own pleasures vicariously in our place. So it's like a kind of separation between what you think you want to be involved with and then how you actually act on that. Right. Yes. In that sense, you can call it the psychoanalytic question. No, um, of course, we have a lot of screen explanations for these kinds of behavior that one day we will read what we have photomorphed or it's very important that we have a certain archive from which we can take the text of the time and so on. But these screen explanations have their question level points. No, uh, very often it's much easier for me to go to the library again and find the book there instead of uh, scanning my archives where I may not find uh, the copies anymore. And so in many of our everyday actions, we could ask these uncanny questions. Are we not somehow relying like magically upon the fact that the copying machines reach in our place, that the recording devices watch movies in our place, uh, that our bookshelf reads the books in our place. There's a nice little novel by Flo, uh, Bibliomaniac, where he exactly read the books. He wants to have them at his bookshelf. I mean, the passivity explanation would be because he acted if the bookshelf were able to read the books vicariously. So maybe this can bring us to a kind of definition of how you understand interpassivity. So it starts off as a notion about art, and then how did you kind of expand that to include a kind of more general theory of, of how we enjoy and how we act? Yes. Um, the enjoyment of the artwork was, of course, not only one special case of, of this whole problem. And what the artists themselves raised as question concerned our everyday life. Oops. They raised properly the question, wouldn't you like them to go and meet your friends? Or wouldn't you like them, for example, to write postcards to your friends in your place mm -hmm. so that you could do whatever your, your tax declaration or something <laughs> at the same time? Yeah. So um, the interpassivity problems were initially uh, small problems in the artwork, but from there it spread out to problems that could be discovered in the whole everyday practices that everybody 
thoughts. Is this something that we like, how expansive is it? I, I guess I'm asking, like, is it a way that we kind of always act or is it uh, a rise in the way that we act, a kind of new form of action and enjoyment, or has it been going on since you say, maybe since the Greeks? Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question. Uh, I, of course, we were asking that ourselves at the time. Did we discover only the concept or did we discover the thing? Did we discover interpassivity as such? And we had soon, of course, to admit that the thing must have existed for a long time, for example, with the Greeks. Um, so what was new was maybe rather our unawareness of the existence of this thing. Maybe earlier epochs and cultures were a bit more aware of this because they were more ritualistic. We soon found out that interpassivity is a crucial feature of the ritual, well, not only of the ritual that it was for the Greeks to attend a magic representation on stage, but also the rituals, religious rituals, state rituals, university rituals, whatever, because all these rituals especially for us, raise always this doubt, are we really meaning it? So we, we dress a bit funnily for whatever, for the uh, honorary ceremony of whatever huge graduates and something, and then we say Latin formulas that we hardly understand, uh, and then it was done and the ceremonial act is uh, accomplished. And we ask ourselves, did we really mean it? Did we really understand it? Did we really think of it? But it doesn't matter. It has to be done in a certain way. And so all the rituals contain a fundamental interpassive dimension. And that is also what often caused the rage of religions, even against their own rituals. This is something that Sigmund Freud describes very nicely in uh, his early essay, Obsessive Actions and Religious Rituals. Uh, where he very nicely describes this stunning fact that also in the history of religions and not only in the history of obsessive neurosis, we can observe that rituals that started big, like for example, putting somebody into a river, end up small, like putting a few drops of water on the head of that person, for example. Of earlier times, you had to wash your whole body in later times, you just put your finger into a small amount of water. So, you know? yeah. uh, and uh, not only that the rituals become smaller and smaller and miniaturized, but at certain points, Freud says, there's even this strange point that uh, a whole ritual religion abandons many of its own rituals. And this is precisely due to the suspicion of interpassivity. At the moment when we feel that the ritual does it in our place, we may seem a bit uncanny and try to reappropriate what we consider to be this content and then we want to have it on our own, as it were. Previous epochs were a bit more uh, relaxed about that. They found it nicely. The things were going on and they didn't bother about being personally involved very much. This is something that um, relates to the history of subjectivity that we more and more tend to have opinions that are our own and our convictions have to be our own and not just uh, represented to other people. Or, for example, our sexual identity has to be our own and our own dreams and not just something that we display for others in order to entertain them. So I think this is the cultural shift and the key issue is precisely this externality of this alienation of something that we more or less feel should be our own. Yeah, the question of, uh, I thought you articulate very nicely in the introduction to your Illusions Without Owners book, where you're trying to distinguish between beliefs that are sort of immediately believed in and beliefs that are, are kind of practiced at a distance. And I, I really found it very interesting, the quote from Engels, where he's he's describing the, the scholar in the 17th century who believed in uh, ancient Greek myth at, at least as much as the ancient Greeks did. And that kind of implants a, a kind of strange, there's kind of a parallax there because our presumption would be that, of course, the Greeks would have believed profoundly in their gods uh, in a very immediate way. But you draw this very nice point that, that it might actually introduce this distinction where 
like as you were just saying, there's like a there's a chance that the Greeks actually didn't believe in their gods as much as we think that they did. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And I think this can be demonstrated easily, you know. Uh, and that was also what what somehow stumbled the scholars in nineteenth century, because I mean, it's obvious that Greeks have very funny gods. <laughs> Greek gods are drunk; they are sexually greedy. If you don't care, they just uh, take away your love partner in order to, to seduce them, or um, they seduce you and drag you away. Um, no matter what sexual orientation or whatever, the Greeks were, Greek gods were fucking all around the place. Uh, Greek gods were also uh, notoriously irresponsible. They were little children with bow and arrow and shooting around love arrow, arrows, no? And this explains why love often falls where it should not fall. You fall in love. <laughs> With your, with them a coworker or with your psychoanalyst mm -hmm. or some other person that you absolutely should not fall in love, but it happens. The Greeks explained this nicely by saying, "Well, it's a irresponsible little child, this little Eros, and he shoots around playing with his toys, and that hits you, and that's why you fall in love, not with the most reasonable choice, but with some uh, occasionally hit." Uh, partner that uh, got hit by an arrow. So <laughs> the question that the scholars raised was, of course, can anybody reasonably believe in such gods? Oops. And this is not what we would consider a re reasonable being. But on the contrary, this allows for a variety of funny practices in culture in order to entertain such gods with their infantile uh, minds. You had to hold Olympic Games, so they, they were considered a bit like a television public, so human beings had to present what they could do in sports and dancing and music in order to entertain those gods. And that were the religious duties. You were not supposed to believe in the gods. Rather, it was the opposite. It was a bit as if the gods believed in human beings, and human beings had to live up to that belief. Gods hoped that human beings would have, would be entertaining, and the human beings tried to live up to this expectation. And so, what in the Pacific theory helped us to understand was that the presence of a huge amount of material rituals, or for example, of architectural monuments like Gothic cathedrals, must not be taken as a proof of very strong intimate beliefs. But quite to the contrary, just the way the rich religions themselves behave towards their own rituals, uh, which is, we have to take them as like delegations of what could be believed the exterior agents. So the big cathedrals uh, were approved, not that people in the Middle Ages uh, believed very strongly, but rather that they were very happy. They were just happy with establishing a big monument in which somebody could believe, but they had not to. No? And mm -hmm. whereas the more people became profoundly Christian, Protestant, and so on, uh, the more they had the feeling they themselves had to believe. No? Now they didn't have to go to church anymore and dress nicely on Sunday and look around who else was in church and so on, no? because church and Sunday in the villages is also kind of marriage market and they should make some business talks and whatever. But uh, Protestants really wanted to believe that mean they didn't have to dress nicely, they didn't have to go out to church, meet other people. They just stayed at home in their parlor and read in the Bible and asked themselves if they were true believers. No? So what we find is actually that belief uh, that is appropriated, we can call this faith, is a late result in cultural history. And it goes always along with a loss of material practice. So the more material practice you have, you have the more interpassivity you have, the more belief that is not your belief. The less material practice you have, the more faith you find. Mm -hmm. There's something in your book, Illusions Without Owners, that you, you start with a lot of examples and you just, you're describing these examples as illusions. Uh, which is not typically a word that 
I personally encounter in, in theory. Um, so I'm wondering if you can explain what you mean by illusions. Well, I follow here the definition given by Freud. An illusion is not necessarily an idea that is wrong. An illusion is something that is must be created out of a wish. So for example, if my favorite football team is playing on television and I cross my thumbs, uh, it is not that I think that my crossing of my thumbs will actually help them, uh, but I express my wish that they may win. No? So mm -hmm. this is what Freud calls an illusion. Illusion can even be true. No? He says the bourgeois girl who has the illusion she will marry a prince, she can be right. But the origin of this idea is not like uh, uh, like trying to think of what is probable, but she thinks what she wishes for. No, that's that's the mark of the illusion. Mm -hmm. and now, many things that uh, we find in this area can be described like that. Uh, Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein has also this nice example in his discourse about. Uh, James George Fraser's golden bow, where he says, because Fraser, the anthropologist, had uh, remarked that uh, like savages, as he calls them, have magic, and later on we had religion, and now we have got technique. No? And Fraser thinks <clears throat> that magic practices like voodoo are, in a way, the equivalent to our what whatever a cruise missile or you know, whatever technical as uh, <laughs> the long range uh, weapons huh? the only difference fraser says uh, the savages somehow uh, have established a wrong idea about the causal connections huh? uh, so the savages believe in the efficiency of magic uh, we know better and so we believe in the efficiency of our technical devices and wittgenstein uh, very nicely in his remarks on Fraser's golden bow points out that this is wrong on both levels. In the first place, Wittgenstein says uh, the savages also uh, make a difference between magic practices and technical practices. Wittgenstein says when the true enemy comes, the savages don't make the two, but they shoot with bow and arrow. No? No. <laughs> <laughs> they don't believe in their magic practices or in their voodoo as we believe in our artillery. And secondly, Wittgenstein says what is even more uncanny, we also do magic things. Yes. So he gives an example of his own experience. He sits at the dinner, some other guest speaks very loud and laughs very loud and annoys Wittgenstein. And then Wittgenstein observes himself uh, biting on his own lips like this. And he says... Do I have to believe that this will stop the other so from talking so loud? And he says, no, I don't have to believe it, but I do it still. No? And this is how we have to describe magic. Magic is never something that people really believe in. Magic is something that people do against their better knowledge. And um, I think if we regard it from this viewpoint, we can find many magic practices in our culture. No? For example, the intellectuals that photocopy books. To a certain extent, this can be regarded as a magic practice. But we have also other nice magic practices like politeness, for example. No? Polite is a kind of symbolic ritual which we don't have to mean serious. It's just purely formal. We have to do it right. Just like in magic, you have to do it right. You have to say the right words so at the right time in the right number and so on. No? And so, um, we have to acknowledge that in a culture, there are not only the illusions that we are familiar with, the things that we are happy and proud to believe in. Some people are happy and proud to declare that they believe in God. Leftists are proud and happy to, to declare that they believe in human progress. Neoliberals are happy and proud to declare that they believe in the self-regulation of the financial markets. Uh, but at the same time, all these people have another type of beliefs which they would never declare their own. No? They would never say that they believe that number 13 will bring about mischief. So, but if you give them the whole, the, 
room number 13, they might ask if they could have another one. Mm -hmm. So this is like, this is the distinction we draw between uh, beliefs with owners and beliefs without owners, right? Right, right. I follow here this influential essay by a French psychoanalyst, Octave Manoni. Um, it was translated into English, I think, under, under, t under the title, I know quite well, but all the same. Or in the Shizekian tradition, it's more quoted as, I know quite when, but still. No? Mm -hmm. so in this beliefs without owners, we always find this split, Manoni says. This is what he calls beliefs as opposed to faith, where you say, I believe in this and I, I know that this is true, I believe this is true, whereas this is faith. Whereas belief means you say, I know quite well that this is silly, but still I have to do it. So for example, I meet a friend at the coffee house before I start talking with him. I say, excuse me, I know quite well it's quite silly, but could you please give me your newspaper? I just have to see how the football game ended last evening. So, no. so we have many of the silly little passions, which are quite charming, but which we do not declare our own convictions, but which we declare as something quite silly, but still the ESG. And how would you, uh, that, that kind of Zizekian turn, uh, uh, I know very well, but I do it anyway, or how would you, because he usually calls that ideology. That's usually how he, often how he defines it. Is there a way that you think belief or interpassivity does a, does a better job of explaining those sorts of rituals than ideology? Well, the, um, what interpassivity theory and what the theory of illusions without owner contributes is to make clear that ideology exists in different modes. That's the important point about it. And we often find the tensions between these two types, between people's faith on one side, which is also ideology, of course, and their beliefs, which they practice a little bit more unacknowledged and so on. And to lay my cards open, I would say, if you study theorists like Marcel Moss, Emile Durkheim, George Bataille, you could make the point that on the side of faith, there is people's obedience. But on the side of belief, there is what people actually find life worth living for. And that is somehow also a revolutionary resource. So I would say that the covering or the sub superposition of faith over beliefs to the extent that in our society, we are almost not aware that we have beliefs, as Wittgenstein pointed out, uh, is uh, that, that testifies to the fact that our revolutionary potentials or that our revolutionary impulses have become less accessible to us. No, just think of the fact that, for example, people sometimes started fighting because some silly pleasure practices were denied to them. You know, uh, one of the biggest prison revolts in former Yugoslavia uh, started at the point where when prisoners were not allowed to see the final of a basketball European or uh, championship final. Uh, so, they, so for these things, people really get in rage. And so, for example, also in all these Arab revolutions and, and the Turkish revolution on Tahrir Square, uh, football fans played a very important role because they were used to fighting, but also used to solidarizing, even for uh, an apparently silly cause. Oops. But that has to be taken seriously. And also, for example, the fact that people sometimes feel that they have got an honor and they will not allow their honor to be damaged, for example, by the silly boss or something. So uh, this is um, a resource that sometimes brings people to fight for a cause, even, and precisely, and it's the funny point, even if they regard this thing a little bit as silly, if they say, I know quite well, but still I have to fight for this honor. Mm -hmm. 
speaking in terms of these what you call it silly little enjoyments it's another thing that i has very really much uh very much stood out to me in your work is adult pleasures that were formerly enjoyed like smoking and drinking wearing fur driving a, a car these sorts of things were uh supplanted at some point in the 90s let's say uh by a, a different kind of regime of pleasure uh without a uh, pleasures without the dangerous x the dangerous element right Cafe the decaffeinated coffee alcohol free beer etc um so yeah i wonder if you could kind of tie that into what you were just saying how these enjoyments of these silly little pleasures has changed and what that might say yes thank you well the first thing that we can uh, take into account here is we have again to do with something that appears like a leap of enlightenment no? now we know that smoking is dangerous and that drinking alcohol can harm your liver in former times obviously people were naive and ignorant and they didn't know uh, they thought smoking was healthy and, and drinking also and so on so we are the smarter guys and that's why we don't do it no? this is exactly the same narrative as Fraser had no? The, the savages do magic, we know better, that's why we don't do it. No? So uh, this rather testifies for the blindness of this uh, allegedly civilized people, because, for example, when it comes to smoking, there's a beautiful book by American author Richard Klein, Cigarettes Are Sublime, where he says, if we hadn't known that cigarettes were dangerous, we would never have smoked them. It was precisely the danger that <laughs> made them sublime, right? So, uh, so we have to to replace this naive narrative of enlightenment with a different one, and say what has happened in our culture that all of a sudden we start questioning precisely those things that until one generation ago were like not just pleasures but actually what people found life worth living for. No? Mm -hmm. um, for example, in First and Second World War, soldiers were exchanging their food for cigarettes. Mm -hmm. others, so, so cigarettes were extremely important to them, for example, to maintain a little bit of dignity. Yeah. Even, for example, people who were executed were given the last cigarette, no? so that at least in the last moment of your life, you could um, experience that your life was worth living for. No? Also, there's an additional punishment, of course, but also uh, in order to allow this ritual of transition. And um, what anthrop anthropologist Arnold van Gennep, Gennep, Gennep um, called Rite de Passage, rituals of pas passage or yeah. transition. No? So we often need these things in order to pass from one status to the next. When a new colleague comes to the university, he often uh, welcomes this colleague with a rainy clip, with a glass of wine or something. No? And if you now start saying, well, uh, is this not a waste of time? Can we not skip that? Or should we not at least drink something more healthy, mineral water? No? It loses its ceremonial character and mm -hmm. by a very good reason because all these elements belong to the sphere of what anthropologist Michel Nervi has nicely called uh, the sacred of everyday lives. And the sacred of everyday lives means there is a huge amount of sacred things which don't belong to institutionalized religions but which we treat as equally sacred as the sacred things of the religions. For example, to some people it is sacred uh, that they watch uh, their football game or on Saturday after. Or for other people it is sacred that at some point they drink a glass of wine, for example, when they have finished their manuscript. Also a ritual of transition. Stop at some work and now they begin something else and this has to be celebrated and marked in time with a glass of wine. And it is typical for all these elements of sacred of everyday life that they contain a kind of malign element, something that is not um, uh, not acceptable, not good, and not healthy at any time. You know? uh, and this is exactly what what uh, is the difference between profane objects and sacred objects. Sacred objects have this 
ambiguity to them, which you think of totally them and Gabu, but Freud, where he says precisely this about this Polynesian word Gabu. Gabu means on the one hand filthy and on the other holy. And this is something that we find a bit strange, but we must not forget that almost all Indo-European languages have two words for the sacred. No? English has sacred and holy, and Greeks had hagios and osios, and Latin had sancta and sarza, uh, no? like Agamben, homo sarza. So in all languages, you find two words for this, and this is precisely because the sacred always has got two faces. Basically, in normal conditions, it is forbidden, ugly, against good taste, transgressive, uh, disgusting, whatever. But under certain conditions, the conditions of celebration, it becomes sublime, the greatest pleasure of all. And under the conditions of celebration, it becomes obligatory. So the sacred changes between forbidden and obligatory. For example, we would stay away from drinking champagne for a normal lunch. Also, the way that the restaurant would look at you a bit strange if you said, can I have a glass of champagne with my schnitzel? But if, for example, you celebrate your graduation, of course you have to toast with a glass of champagne and you have to toast with others, uh, even if the doctor has prohibited you to drink alcohol. Right? At least you have to, to, to clink the glasses against the others and drink a little amount so mm. that uh, it gets yeah. celebrated. You know? This is the strange and interesting nature of, of sacred objects. Profane objects are completely different. You can have them all the time. They are almost every time allowed, even at the tea meeting, you can have mineral water or something. Um, but it's never obligatory. You're never forced to drink mineral champagne of the mm-hmm. contrary, mm-hmm. all the time forbidden, but at some moments you're obliged to drink champagne. And this is the nature of the sacred object, which has become more and more ununderstandable to us because we don't quite know how to deal with this silly things. Things that we know are not healthy, but still we have to drink them, folks. And I think this is the change in culture. We have a new, like, wave of faith getting stronger and belief getting more disregarded. And at the same time, uh, we start to attack precisely all those things that people found life worth living for. All yeah. these sacred things. Moments when you could celebrate with your friends, you could party with your friends, we smoke together some pretty maybe in some hidden place when we were like 13 years old and for the first time you did not obey your parents, but you were stuck together with your friends, you formed a bond of solidarity, somebody got the cigarettes and the separately smoke and then thank very ever, no? And and the same with sex, of course. No? Also, sex belongs to the sacred of everyday life. No? Even if somebody touches your shoulder in the subway, you find it disgusting and, and shouldn't be. But <laughs> if the beloved person touches your shoulder, that can become a kind memory that you don't want to forget for all your life. No? So under the sacred conditions of love, uh, disgusting things can become sublime. No? But this is something that our culture less and less understands. We have again, um, undergone a kind of um, what Max Weber calls disenchantment of the world. You know? Our former sacred things have become ugly and filthy to us and disgusting and unhealthy. And we believe that we are very smart because we know that they are disgusting and unhealthy and not whatever gender or whatever. Uh, but everybody knew that before but they have a different stance in terms of ideology with regard to these things because they knew quite well that these are the things worth what life is worth living for. And the things that life is worth living for are precisely what people all were rebelling when they were making a revolution. Yeah? So mm. just remember, mm. I mean, you know this poem by Bertolt Brecht, which always impressed me a lot, uh, the resolution of the communards. Fresh, um, <clears throat> imagines the Paris communards in 1971 speaking to their enemies and they say uh, we have considered that you will now threaten us with guns and cannons uh, and 
considering this, we have to decided that from now on we fear bad life more than death. Right? <laughs> this is the political stance that we have to fight for. And that's why I insisted so much on these practices, because if people don't know anymore what life is worth living for, and if they don't have these exercises of party readers, if they don't have that anymore because they find it disgusting, ugly, unhealthy, whatever, uh, then they, they stop fearing bad life more than death. And so on and so on. 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 And so on and so on.